This is PodKit, episode 60, The Shallow Web, on Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. And now, routingly a modal. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk60. Kidders, welcome back. Hello. How's it going? It's going well. Nice. Well, you know, it seems like time flies here because apparently it hasn't even been a month yet since we did this last. What? Come on. It's amazing. But as, Calendars. as Brandon knows very well, it is still March. Yep. March never ends. It just nope. goes on and on, my friends. Yep. You know, in a couple of weeks, we'll be closer to March 2021 than we will March 2020. Thank God. March 2021 can't come soon enough. After all, it's like March 200th. I mean, does the, do the marches reset as they stack? Like, is it like um, that game with the blocks? I don't play games. No. Tetris? I think you can, I think you can lop, I think you can loop, or you can, you can lap, lap it. That's the phrase I was looking for. You can lap. So it'll be, it'll be like March 365th, 366th. Oh, or does it become yeah. closer to the next March and then it's suddenly March negative 180 or no, not, uh. Whatever half of 365 is that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we are sufficiently off topic. So let's go back to April instead of March. Perfect. And let's talk about <laughs> things we were doing in April. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody got an iPad. Uh, did, did, no, did nobody somebody, got an iPad. <laughs> did, did somebody I think we got keyboards. <laughs> yeah, we got, we, iPad we got keyboards. And I don't think, did mine arrive in April? I feel like it was May, but it, you know it could have been April. Who time is a construct. Yeah, at this point, we nobody has a proof or an, a knowledge of what happened before us. <laughs> it's true. Uh, let's talk about this real quick. Um, let's start off with Brandon, though. Uh, even though that he's at the end of our show note list here, let's start off with him. You've had an iPad on, and a modern one at that for quite some time now. Yeah. Also, I uh, last June, so so not three months ago, but a year and three months ago. I picked up an iPad Pro um, around the time of WWDC um, because I was looking at something that I wanted to serve as a kind of an email machine, but also something that could, um, frankly, do a lot of the fancy new AR stuff, which was at the time new um, because you needed a certain uh, certain chip. I can't remember which, uh, probably the A12X like that to uh do the uh object occlusion stuff which has been a real big thing which at the time had been a real big thing that was kind of viewed as the next the next big obstacle for lack of a better phrase for serious augmented reality applications um because basically what happened before is if if there was a th- object in the physical world and your um and you placed a 3D object anywhere in the world that object wouldn't know about other physical objects. It would just assume that it would be in the foreground. So like you could put a cube in front of you and it would always be in front of you, whether there's a table or a chair or a block or a wall in the middle of it, right? It wouldn't care. Um, but at a certain point, um, you know, folks got wise and they figured out a way to basically allow objects in the physical world to occlude, um, which is to say they block or bifurcate or bisect 3d objects and this ipad was the first thing you could do that for so that's why i picked one up but ever since then it's actually i basically stopped doing ar work at that point and um so that was kind of silly but the ipad had become an indispensable part of my work so basically all my emails anytime i have to write anything up i'll grab the ipad rather than my macbook or um or use my desktop or anything like that and the reason for it often has to do with the fact that nobody Nobody can reach me on the iPad, <laughs> which is kind of confusing, right? Um, but the iPad is an isolated, single-purpose, you know, one-track mind computing machine. And so I've been typing a lot of my emails, a lot of my lengthy Slack messages, all that good stuff goes on the iPad. And so I got the, um, I want to call it a magic keyboard. Is that what it's called? The magic keyboard? Smart keyboard. The smart keyboard is what it's called. Uh... Smart magic keyboard. Yeah, I don't know. I think they. I feel like they gave it a new name for the one to the stand, but okay, I could be wrong. I don't own one. I, I will. I will say. I, so I have the cloth cover covered keys one, and I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of it. I don't have the fancy stand, um, but my dad picked up one that has a fancy stand, and and I have to say it turns the iPad into something that looks quite a bit more like a like a laptop. Like it. It literally is the like tablet that's a laptop dream 
and it has a mouse in there and everything like that. And it's, it's pretty intense. It's pretty fancy. Um, but for my part, I've been more than happy with it just as it is. And I'll probably keep, I'll probably burn this thing into the ground as much as I possibly can because, um, it's, it's a really, really nice machine. And, you know, if I could do iOS development and web development on it, and I've tried to do my fair share of web development on it, um, I would, because it's, it's just bar none, a, a really, a really great machine. So that's all I have to say about that. So let's go and continue in reverse order with Brian. So Brian bought, uh, an iPad pro, uh, keyboard for his 2016 iPad pro. Tell us more. Yeah. So, um, well, Ryan was the one who started this. Uh, you were posting about a new case you got. I'm like, oh, I should get one too. Cause I've, I had, you know, been wanting to use my iPad a little bit more. The new iPad had just come out and I decided not to get it. So I want to make my current iPad experience a little bit better. And so, um, I was looking on Apple. Apple doesn't sell the smart keyboard for this iPad anymore because it's a 2016 iPad. So I went on eBay and I bought one. Um, it was, you know, a little bit discounted from what Apple would sell it for, but still a bit more expensive than I probably would have liked but i did buy new so that that was probably why but anyway um yeah it's the apple keyboard it it's nice to type on um usually i'll have that at my desk lately i've been playing lots of cookie clicker so my macbook has taken up the space the ipad usually is at my desk so i can Mm. keep clicking the cookie but uh yeah it's nice to type on um especially if it's been open for a little while when i first open it it kind of hovers above and i kind of have to hold hold down the edge of it with a thumb and then type away. But if it's been open for a little bit, it kind of flattens out and whatnot. So yeah, it's nice. Nice to have keyboard, you know, command tab between apps is awesome. It's just a lot of the keyboard shortcuts just feel really intuitive until uh, all of a sudden you don't. And I'm trying to clear Slack notifications with the escape key that doesn't exist on the keyboard and things like that. But that's typical of most Apple keyboards these days. (laughs) Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, what about you, Ryan? So I, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017, I bought a, at the time, a modern iPad Pro, but it turns out um, Apple decided that wasn't modern enough, so they made it actually look good with no bezels um, and no no chin and no forehead and no button thing. Uh, well, so much for that then. But I kept it anyway, and I kind of didn't have a use for it for a year and a half because we kind of stopped doing our react native dev. Uh, but then, uh, when teams became enforced, uh, at work, I thought, well, iPad is good for that. Cause that way I don't have to, uh, contaminate my phone. Yep. Well, uh, if you are typing frequently on an iPad and you have hands, your hands will fall off. I believe that's something that Steve Jobs said once. Um, so I, I bought uh, something that kind of came out in um, springtime of this year. It was uh, launched alongside those fancy uh, keyboards that you were talking about earlier, the Magic Keyboard for the iPad. Oh, sure. Uh, but instead of an Apple first-party product, it was a kind of like a companion thing, like a joint venture kind of thing that they did with Logitech. And it's just, uh, you know, it's kind of like they made the crayon, which is like a second party pencil uh-huh. um and yeah you know it's uh it's pretty cool so you get the trackpad and it's the same kind of glassy trackpad that you would expect on a macbook pro um it has very similar gestures i mean it's it's exactly the same as the magic keyboard version it's just cheaper uh and for the older product i really need to get a review on this going but i probably won't ever do that now that we talked about it it's funny how that works yeah, this is the review now. This is the review. This is the review now. And so the problem with the whole thing is while it is great to have a keyboard and a little trackpad thing so you can mouse around on your iPad screen, it just turns out that uh, iOS and um, apparently it's called iPad OS now is useless for keyboards and mice. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw what Apple did with the, the cursor on the screen. Uh-huh. So when you mouse around to stuff, there is a button... The cursor is captured by the button. It's like the the cursors have gravity, and there's a like a gravity well around the buttons, and uh, the things stick together, and it's really annoying. Like iOS is not suited for actual multitasking, and a keyboard makes you feel that way, but it's still not. So if you actually wanted a computer, I would recommend waiting until October, when there's a uh, an Apple Silicon chip based MacBook of some type, and it will actually be useful. Yeah, we'll see. I think, yeah, iPadOS has room to grow for sure. 
the the mouse stuff is uh interesting i see i saw mostly praise for it but i haven't used it much i uh, I'd connected my magic trackpad to my iPad at one point to try it out, but <laughs> that's all. One touch interface with another. That's awesome. That is, that's kind of great. And it, and it's weird because you, you just, you look at it and you think, well, that is an improvement. And like your first day or two, it, it's a remarkable improvement, but then you come to the conclusion, like it's still useless. Yeah. The, the power user, you know, quick moving around between stuff is a lot easier on a desktop OS still, I think. I go through waves. It's nice for messaging and things, but like I was um, chatting with some friends just last night in Google Hangouts and I was using the iPad version and they're like talking about this chat interface. The chat literally did not exist in the Hangouts and it's it's separate from the chat of the thread where you started the call. There's like an in-video chat that is just not available on iOS. Perfect. And that's where they're posting things. So I joined on the computer and the history wasn't there. So Incredible. Enough about iPads. Let's talk about the history API instead iPads are great, but it's time for it's time to look backwards before we can look forwards. So you're telling me their history? Yeah, their history. Huh. Yeah, so this is a complete 180 on consumer iPads to deep web APIs uh, <laughs> that I've been working on. So not that kind of deep web. Yeah, not the dark web. That's a different thing. It's the shallow web, you know, the like like the client side. Client side, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so you know, you know, you know, like the, the browsers forward and backwards buttons. I, I have I have heard about those. I never use them. I try not to use them, yeah, if I can help it. Or if you swipe left, you swipe right. Do you use that? No, try not try not to do that either. Wow, okay. In any context. Well, maybe a listener has done that once or twice. Anyway, so that's implemented on top of a stack. And that whole like feature set is called the history API. And you basically have three events. You can push a new route to the stack. You can replace a current a route at the current location, or you can pop a route off the stack. Now when you pop it off the stack, it's actually just shifting in the stack where you currently are. And so then if you if you pop it like just moves your current index back and then if you if you push or replace a new route it will destroy everything that was in front of your current index. But if you pop you can then go you can pop forwards and you can pop backwards. Anyway, so you can store metadata with that too, like location state or location dot state if you're using the React router uh, library which is kind of the abstraction on top of the history API that I am familiar with. Also the literal npm package called history which is a wrapper around the history api so the history api is mostly uh that abstraction it's kind of what i mean because that's how i've used it anyway uh this kind of came up so i'll I'll use the example from amy simmons talk at react rally this last august as the example because i think it's it's a little more public and clear versus my use of my work but their example was they uh she was working on a feature to or in the in the image viewer in the twitter.com site, right? It's a modal. You can click the next next arrow or maybe your use a keyboard to go next and back if you have multiple images you're looking at at once. They're adding a feature that was a sidebar of like related tweets or, you know, extra information. But, you know, and you can click into that and that kind of stuff. But they still want the close button on the modal to work or you hit escape and for it to go back to where you were before you opened the modal. But previously that that worked, but now if you could um right, yeah i think so if they're going forward back photos it would use history.replace so if you hit the close button on the modal or hit escape it would just call history.go back basically go back one item in the history stack which would have been whatever page you were at before opening the modal however when you have this detail view you can like click into more stuff if you're kind of played around with that your uh, route might change and then you you would click like the close button and it would just take you back one you would keep clicking the close button and it wouldn't actually close the modal. It would just keep taking you back a bit. So how, how do you solve this? You have to kind of then like uh, key on your history routes and find a, like you attach metadata for each route. So like um, I think they added it through, they would add some metadata if their current page or the current route was a modal route. And when you hit the X on closing the modal, it would go back X number of pages until it wasn't a modal route. So go to the most recent non-modal route and that's and then you would diff your current index and the index of that non-modal route. And that's how many pages you would go back when you hit the X. What that means is it'll, it'll take you back to where you were, but then you can hit forward and you can replay what you did leading up to that. So it's like uh, building on top of the stack is just, you know, sliding your way through that stack. But anyway, in order to like diff that, you have to build and you have to track the changes, the pop, the push, and the replace events that come through. And 
store that uh, unique location key, which is part of the React router and history APIs. Um, if you're using a browser router, not a hash router, which is biting us in the butt. And so we're, we're working on that as well. And then you need to keep track of this metadata about a route. So basically based on her talk and an example that Ryan Florence wrote in a code sandbox, um, we re-implemented it, uh, made some improvements on that example and adapted it to work for our app. Still developing it, but it's it's quite fun to dive deep into the history API. It's um, I I think I definitely understand how it all works now. It's not so magical anymore. Um, and it, it's awesome to use the app and like to click around, go forward and backwards. And, you know, we're clicking on some some buttons that are, you know, roll link. They used to be link, but now they're sometimes they're doing history.push if it's like the first link in the stack. But sometimes it'll do history.go and negative six or whatever if it has to go six pages back. So I don't know. It's just really fun to like implement all this feature on top of the history API. And then we're doing even more. We're synchronizing our custom stack and our current index to session storage. So if you reload the page, the browser's history API still is still there, but we need to preserve it so we can rebuild our state and sync it up. Because otherwise, if ours is fresh on every page, refresh and load, then um, you'll hit back in the browser and our app will be like, oh, okay, I'm going to this route. And it, the user may have been there very recently, but our app doesn't know about it because its state is gone. So... Yeah, it's been a fun feature that kind of bleeds all over, the, and um, but we built some good common abstractions around it, and I think we can do some really powerful stuff in the future if we ever need to. Way cool. Yeah, I saw that talk from that was React Rally, right? Time flies. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it was um, it was pretty cool. Uh, I think it's uh, in a lot of the apps that I build, I try to steer our teams away from modals as much as possible because they're evil. Uh, but in those rare cases that we do have them, I, I totally agree. Like you, you need, do need a way to manage whether they're around or not. And once you tie them to your router, like that's going to happen. Yep. And um, in in my my team's app, it's not rendered as a modal, but it's like the mental the mental model for it is effectively a modal, like a overlay sidebar kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. Well, yeah. Some items in the sidebar are replaced. There's like a a big larger back go back button. Mm-hmm. Um. It's like a subset of the application that's available. It's um, for like, you know, I'm working in the logistics industry and it's, you know, for like viewing information about a particular like uh, location, basically, or a lane in the future, you know, any any like unique entity that you want to like look at some more information for. And, you know, it's fully navigable. There's a bunch of different pages and stuff. And it's like, it's like you're just clicking a, a current thing, but it's, so it's not rendered as a literal modal, but it's effectively and routingly a modal i guess anyway so that's been fun um still still working on finishing that up hopefully get that finalized next week or two but more react things so uh ryan and i were talking in slack the other day and i was complaining about some testing things uh seeing some flakiness with a large component and large component does not portray the scale of this component adequately (laughs) doesn't not at all. It, it's a large component. Massive. Lots of styles. Okay, maybe massive. It rendered. I did the math. If I if I copied the DOM output and then ran it through Prettier, it was like thirteen hundred lines of HTML. Nice. Um, That's pretty big. I, I guess yeah. So it's it's a it's a complex table built with Rack Table. Um, there's some popovers for like more advanced metadata changing about each column and that kind of stuff but um the the library we're using for that is maybe not completely supported by js dom and things so like state is hanging around when it shouldn't be and things aren't closing and there's like multiple popovers open at once in the dom despite the fact that they're supposed to be closed so there's just some weirdness and then tests were we'd use the find by selectors with react testing library and it'd be like, Oh no, I can't find anything. And it would print out what's currently rendered and it would just say empty body tag. And it's like, well, that's uh, it's not good. Where'd the app go? So I don't know what's causing that still to this day, but anyway, Ryan was like, Hey, why don't you just use shallow rendering? And then I'm like, no, we got to talk about this on the episode. So that's what this is. So Ryan, where are you coming from? So here, here's the deal. I don't bother testing components because it's a waste of time. There we go. I test APIs and I do end-to-end testing. I don't have time for component tests. I don't care. Now, I will component test if it's a pure component in the sense that it's like props in, 
stuff out, but like that's it. So you, you test the easy stuff, the like static tests. Yep. Yeah. Th- yeah, those are definitely the easiest to test. Um, I would say at at that point you don't even need to use shallow rendering because it's if it's just in out, it's pure. Yeah. So React testing library does not support shallow rendering, and React testing library is a huge improvement over Enzyme. When Enzyme has adapters for a fully mounting or for mount for fully rendering and mounting a component and for shallow for using React test renderers, uh, shallow rendering. But when you're using hooks, it becomes very difficult to do shallow rendering. Um, the way they, the way they re-render is not completely supported. Enzyme has been a little bit late. Now I haven't used Enzyme a ton in the last year and a half, so I don't know how much of this is super accurate anymore. It was just, Enzyme didn't get the latest React features quite right away. And so it became clunky. You'd have to like mock middle, middle layer kind of stuff out. Um, especially effects and re-rendering they wouldn't fire correctly with shallow you'd kind of have to like force it along and like explicitly call okay re-render despite the effect kind of was supposed to do that for you and with you know complex components that have a lot of um they're passing props and event handlers around then it's a lot easier to just render it in more integration style and so that's kind of how react test and library works and then you interact with your components as they're as they're rendered in your test environment, um, how a user would. So you're selecting it by text. You're, you're selecting by the accessibility role, um, which could either be the element name or if it has the role attribute. So like you could say a role button uh, and you can give it like a config object and say, okay, and the name is, you can pass a string if it's exact or a regular expression and kind of partial match on the text of that button. And so you can kind of then f- f- choose your, your, your elements based on their they're more user-driven kind of stuff. And you can interact with your page. Um, it automatically calls React uh, Act function, which is how you uh, kind of update a component in the context of a test. So like the React test number has a fire event. There's also a user event library that has a bunch of helpers around typing and selecting a select element or that kind of stuff, filling out form values, things like that. So it, it wraps around a lot of the React base APIs, and so it makes it pretty easy. You just kind of like expect some things, do some events, expect some more things, and it's nice and pretty straightforward. Now, for complicated things, it gets a lot more built out, and it's more like kind of workflows from what I found for some of our more most complex parts of the application I mostly work on. But it's it's a lot better than Enzyme, and I think it's a lot more pure because you're, you're testing on the rendered DOM output. So how it's implemented in terms of React really doesn't matter at all. We've done full refactors and the tests don't need to change at all because the end the end result for the user is the same. That was really nice when going from class to functional components with hooks is we could kind of, if we wrote our test in React Testing Library, which we started using React Testing Library when hooks were released and we started using hooks. So we kind of had to update our tests as we re- updated our components. But there are a few cases where we updated the test before the component and super slick to just rewrite your whole component and the test just still pass or for the most part still pass and but yeah complicated things especially around asynchronous events and um, effects re-rendering things and timers there's there's a lot you have to kind of understand about how the test environment works how jest works and how react renders things so there's a bit to learn um, when we're getting deep into it but I don't know. I've been able to wrap my head around it, and I I enjoy it at least. I like it a lot more than Enzyme stuff. Enzyme stuff was very rigid, and you're testing the implementation details. And it felt like it would break all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because yeah, you 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 change how you build your component. You have to change your test because your test is testing that you built your component in the way you built it originally. Don't test that it renders a specific component. Test that it renders a header with the right text in it or something. I don't know. I mean, at that point, you should just trust that it works. Uh, but beyond that, uh, a funny thing that uh, I did in re- this regard is I actually bought um, Kent's testing tutorial package thing. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Never watched a single video. Hmm. Uh, it's about been about a year now. Should really get around to it. I'm definitely revisiting a little bit of that. Um, the the difference for me, so I don't I don't have that particular one, but I've I enjoy the courses on front end masters hashtag front end masters i am a shul for front end masters one of the things that i think is um what has been interesting is i've actually used testing of this sort what you could what you could 
consider an analog to component level testing uh, in Flutter. Now, of course, there aren't really courses for Flutter because Flutter doesn't have quite the same cult of personality that React does. Um, but one of the things you can do, and one of the things that's really important to me as a mobile app developer is generating consistent screenshots oh, yeah. um, and enough screenshots so that I can submit to the app store and, and not really have to think, not really have to spend what can be an absurd amount of time just opening up seven simulators and taking seven sets of screenshots for both platforms and then uploading them into each of the, each of the stores. So there's a really cool tool you can use called screenshots um, from the folks behind Fastlane. Actually, it's a Fastlane tool called screenshots and um, it, it's kind of nice. There's a, there's a, there's a way you can do it where it can be triggered from um, your flutter widget tests so widgets are like flutter's word for components so essentially what you can do is you can wire it up so that when you run your tests if you pass it the right options to tell it you want this um it will take your ios screenshots for you um and and on android too and you can use that both as a test as like screenshot testing um to diff to visually diff between the the screenshots and also you can use it as like a form of and you can also just upload it to, to the app. But as a result, I, it's kind of infectious. I've been I've been starting to write. Um, I think because I've ha- already had to think in those ways to um, to do that. I'm actually coming around a little bit to component testing in the sense of testing particular critical user flows. I think that I'm starting to understand that a little bit better. Whereas usually I would have I would have been very much in your camp, Ryan. Where like well you know, the, the value prop isn't necessarily there, um, in some circumstances, um, if you're doing other kinds of testing that kind of make it moot, I think like, especially with screenshot testing, I think that's been something that's been a really nice, like, you know, smoke check to make sure, you know, all right, got everything set up. Is it working? Great. I can run, I can run through it step-by-step with screenshots. I mean, that's the other thing too, is like, then when you have something like that set up, you can, you can also use that as like, to generate instruction manuals and stuff for people or, you know, step-by-step guides because you've already written out how it's supposed to work. And if it changes, then you have, you have like, you're ready to catch that too. I don't know. It's, it's, I'm coming around to it is all, is all I'm saying. That's, that's a great use case. Yeah. I've, yeah, I haven't thought about that. I know there are tools for like automating screenshots for native applications, but yeah, for testing and stuff too, you can rip it all in, all into one. And for like web UIs, um, I think of like puppeteer, you can do screenshots and, um, for my app at work, we, we do a lot of puppeteer testing as we, de- for our deploys to make sure things are running smoothly and, you know, the full end to end. We're not using screenshots currently, but puppeteer does let you take screenshots. Uh, I think a lot of people are using it for debugging when tests fail. They'll take a screenshot to see like, yep. okay, what's, what does the page look like when it fails? That reminds me of that, uh, react rally talk about the, um, Weird AI powered screenshot differ. Yeah, yeah. I forget what that was called. No. Yeah, yeah no. No. None of it that. It looked really cool, but it was it was like prohibitively expensive. I thought. Yes, it was about infinity dollars per um, instance. I I don't when when somebody considers AI or you know when somebody considers that their unique value proposition, I start to get very cautious and when i hear that and then i also hear that it costs a million dollars then i'm extreme then i'm then i move beyond caution into your kind of a uh, your your snake oil person um yeah a little bit maybe in that particular one but yeah you know it, it, the idea was in a good place it just uh, was poorly delivered i think they, they were selling a service on top of it too though so right. that hosting and management of you know screenshots over time and that kind of stuff so it was it was more than just the AI model, which seemed pretty nice on its own too. But I mean, you can build it all yourself, but then you have to build it all yourself. So there's, there's value to someone in having a product like that. Yeah. But if it's, but if it's my snake oil, I know it's snake oil is the difference. If it's somebody else's snake oil, then, then there's a, then we have a problem. (laughs) Uh, All right. To, to keep us on the topic of tests um, just today. And I've used this a few times, but I was using it a, extensively again this afternoon is the jest um so you know you know jest right the test runner and management thing i, I am familiar with jest. love jest it's great there's the, the the test object or alias to it 
Um, so normally you, you you have your describes, then you have some it or some test functions, and you can nest a bunch of describes and all that. And you have your before each or after each. But there's also a maybe you know maybe you don't. There's a test dot skip function. Now test and it are the same, so I don't know where you are. So it dot skip it dot only. So you can kind of run just one test within the describe block or just skip it entirely. Um, but there's also this test dot each function which is a little bit different than the other ones. Instead of passing in a function, where is your test, you pass in an array of data, and then that returns a function that you call with, um, so it kind of basically then returns a test context that it will, it'll iterate over your data, and then it'll return like a new test. So you're generating tests from data, and then you can, you, get, you call that function with uh, probably like a, a template literal that you can do some string formatting so you can you know generate test and spec names the idea is you have a bunch of test cases that you want to run the same test logic against each case now you could make one test and you put this array of data inside of that test and you map over the each each element in the data and then you just do expect you know data run through your function to be whatever right i've done that but if any one item fails or if the, f- the first thing that fails, that test will fail. And you don't quite see the whole picture. So if you instead build tests from the data, it'll run it on all items in that data array every time. And it will have a unique uh, test case in the failed test layout. And then it'll format however you want. So it's um, a much like a, a nicer f- interface developer experience. And you can kind of track stuff a lot easier over time. The other thing... So do you think with um do you think with the syntax here you'd be able to do that thing in jest where you tell it to only run this particular name to test from the CLI? Um I that's a good question. I haven't tried. Maybe cuz it's using its formatting. So when it prints out yeah. all tests and things, it is including it like it's just a test you built manually. So I would I would mm-hmm. I would think so. That seems like it would make sense. Cool. Another benefit of this is if you have the same data set and you want to test a few different things based on all the data. So if you have like your your normal condition and then you have like a few one-offs that you want to test on the same data, you can do multiple test.eaches on that data. And so you can do like your happy path, all that data. You can do the the weird case. Does it does it does each one of those things handles the error correctly as well? So or if you have multiple ways with so my, my use case is around parsing URLs and generating a like a, a base URL path that supports all browsers. It's for getting like a configuration in a, in a UI. So we need to support IE. We need to support all browsers. Some of them, some of the apps have a base URL set. So there's a base element in the document head and there's an href attribute. Some browsers don't like IE document.baseuri is not defined. So we have to actually go in, read the base element, get the href, and use that. Other browsers, if they set the base element, or if you set the base element with an href, the browsers will take that and append it to the window.location.origin, which is everything up through like the .com or whatever, including port number mm-hmm. if you're running localhost or whatever. So it kind of smushes that together for you. So you have to handle all those various use cases. So there's just like, and then we have extra stuff around other trailing slashes, other not trailing slashes. So we're like taking the uh, safe route and adding slashes on the edges, but then we're like looping through and removing if there are multiple slashes next to each other, just to like safely add all the slashes and then check and make sure there aren't a bunch of slashes and then remove them again. So the tests are, you know, testing all the cases. If there are slashes, if there aren't slashes, if there's, you know, I, I put in stuff around if there are subdomains, if there aren't, if there's additional paths. So if there was a path name already, uh, testing hash routers. And so like basically every case and then including things like is base URI undefined? Is there no base element added to the DOM at all? And so I had like, I ended up with something like, I think 60 items in this data array of all various different cases. Some of them are probably a little redundant, but then I ran them through and I had three test blocks, one for cool document that base URI is set to something sweet. One where it's using, um, using the DOM base element with an href set. And there's another, and then one with like a hash router, which doesn't really need to be there because it's the way we implemented it. But I thought it would be good to have just for the future. So anyway, it generated like 180 tests in, I don't know, I think the whole test files have around 180 lines, but 
yeah, it was super nice and it runs really fast because it's all pure JavaScript. And it's pretty good. And the nice thing is I didn't have to implement all that location stuff because just runs with the URL object. And what does the URL object have? Nearly every property that the old window.location object has. So I just create a new URL with whatever you want to set the current pages at, and then it auto splices it up. And so it makes patching the window.location object pretty easily or pretty easy. And yeah. Very nice. Those kind of tests are the most fun ones to write because it's like a pretty short function. It's just a bunch of cases you just throw at it and yeah, test at each. Super powerful. Cannot recommend it enough. If you if you're trying to validate um, variable data, you can make a test case out of each data point instead of looping over it in a single test. Nice. I'll do that the next time that I don't have Nest JS code to test. Someday. Someday. Did you say next? Ne- ne- next. No, not 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 that one. I heard uh, Nest. Nest. I heard next. <laughs> That's because because you... Nest. You're obsessed with it. Next, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with Nest. No, the other one. Oh no. <laughs> yes, <sighs> the other one. At any rate, also, at some point I should talk about Svelte. It's not going to be this episode, but I'll talk about Svelte because Svelte turns out is quite cool. Maybe next episode. Yeah, but not today. We're going back to consumer technology today, or pseudo consumer technology. And we're going to talk about a little thing called network attached storage. Because I picked up a gently used Synology disk station four bay thingamajigger from a friend of mine. And uh, it turns out it's pretty cool. I started b- uh, backing up all of my uh, my desktop, my laptops, my laptops and everything to uh, to it over time machine and whatever very various um, OS level backup tools are, are there. And it turns out it's just pretty darn slick. I moved all my media library over there. I'm using Plex now. And it's like, goodness gracious, why didn't I do this a very long time ago? And kind of what precipitated this, in addition to the fact that my friend was selling one of these, is that I haven't actually been able to use my backup service, Backblaze, for quite some time because for whatever reason, I cannot get it to authorize the backup client on my MacBook Pro. I don't know what terrible crimes I've committed that caused it to freak out. But at any rate, um, I've been really, really happy with this network attached storage device. Um, And I'm probably only going to be finding more wacky uses for it in the time to come. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because I know Brian has one of these and uh, has been a big proponent and fan. But I particularly wanted to wanted to ask you kind of get your take on a couple of different things. First one being, do you back up your Synology in any way? And how do you do that? I do. So I have a few different things on my NAS, some of which are um, a few movies and TV shows. And the rest are like kind of personal file backups. Um, I, you know, I have old schoolwork from, I think, sixth grade on. You know, I have random like old websites I've made and various like anything i have like a 250 gigs i don't know i throw like desk like cool desktop wallpapers that i've used in the past and maybe weren't used in the future like random stuff goes there basically if it's not related to like development work or music or my photo library it goes in the nas which is honestly not very much stuff but somehow 250 gigs um i back all that up to backblaze using the backblaze b2 there's an app on the Synology OS that um, lets you connect to some cloud syncing services. So I created a Backblaze B2 account. The 250 gigs or so, maybe it's a little bit less, cost me about $1.50 a month. So it's not too much money. Nice. Um, you know, it does add up over time. I haven't tested downloading it. I think downloading will be a little more expensive. But uploading, honestly, I don't know if it cost me anything. It maybe did. I don't remember if I went up to that rate. Maybe a little bit to upload, like a, you know, a few dollars the first month to upload that much. But otherwise, uh, mm-hmm. the Synology app keeps it in sync. So if I add something to it, it just auto uploads it to Backblaze, and it's super slick. And I think Backblaze has like a thirty day snapshot. Maybe that if I needed to find something that I deleted in the Synology, I could go download it again. But I have not needed to use that. So interesting. Yeah, I was I was considering using Backblaze B2 as well. Um I ended up picking DigitalOcean because that's already going to my uh to the appropriate charge card that I need to use for it. And I think 
you know, it's kind of silly. I think the DigitalOcean pricing is free for up to 250 gigs and then one cent per gigabyte after that, which I think is double what Backblaze charges, which I'm not terribly concerned about. But I, I know from like middle school arithmetic that um, there's a curve with these things. And so, sure, if it's if it's a if it's a fixed fee for the first amount and then a rate after that, um, there's a point where a lower rate from the get go will intersect with that and that rate, that lower rate will win out. Do you have to manage things in DigitalOcean or do you need to, are you going to run a VPS and find some so- software that you are running to synchronize it? And does DigitalOcean have large storage capacity? And tell me more. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, have, an, they have an S3 competitor called uh, DigitalOcean Spaces. And so what you do is you just use the S3 adapter for the Synology backup system and point it at the DigitalOcean instance. And it, it works pretty darn well. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan of that experience because the DigitalOcean product just conforms to the same API as S3. So you can use, like I've used it before on other things that are expecting an S3-like interface. And I just write to... DigitalOcean because I just like DigitalOcean as a product, as a product company a little bit better. You know, just in terms of ethical things, I just prefer DigitalOcean to Amazon, given the choice. So that I think has been really cool. The concern is like, I'm already pushing, I mean, I just backed up my MacBook over time machine to it and I'm trying to decide whether to disable backing up my backups, (laughs) which seems like a dangerous game. But the reason why I want to do that is because, I mean, if I'm looking at, you know, a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. Yes. Right? That's true. So a thousand pennies is ten bucks. So per terabyte, that's uh, ten bucks a month. That's not so bad. In storage? Yeah. It's true, right? All that math kind of made sense. So yeah, I guess in that at that point I don't really care because at that point it's gonna be much more worthwhile to keep backups in, in that are available and are, you know, basically full disk backups of a Synology. For some reason, I did something where I think I did the theoretical maximum capacity of the NAS, which I think is seven terabytes. And I was like, $70 a month. That's absurd. But that's not ever going to happen because the whole point is I'm not filling up the whole thing. And I, so I think backing it up is probably going to be a good call. So with, um, with, with DigitalOcean, is that, is that block storage? Is that object storage? Like, what is that? I believe they have both. I think I'm doing object storage, which is probably not what I want. Yeah, okay. Just checking because I I couldn't, like their website didn't want to tell me, so I didn't know. I think block storage is a thing you can assign to a droplet and object storage is what you have available to you. Object storage is going to be... More S3-like. S3-like, yeah. The way I view it is I'm I'm just using the S3 API like structure the API contract, for lack of a better phrase, to upload files to a service that is not S3 and is cheaper and is run by a company that's slightly more scrupulous. And they're blue. And they're blue. You can't beat that. Uh, blue is a calming color, I'm told. Everything is blue these days. Yeah. Uh, well, the the only other thing I can think of is, Brian, I remember you have a really cool DNS name for yours. I won't say it on the podcast because that seems like a bad idea. <laughs> um, but I I will say that I noticed you did that. you did that really... You set that up, and that was a really cool, um, a really cool thing to do. And I, I poked around in the settings, and I saw a couple things that pretended to be potential options. So I know Synology has a dynamic DNS service. There, there's literally the company called Dyn. I think that does dynamic DNS services. What? How did you set that up? And would you recommend it? So I'm using all free stuff, so that's nice. I did use the Synology hostname thing through their. I forget what they call it. You looked at it more recently. Maybe you remember. It's like direct access, direct read access, read write access, direct name. Direct X. Direct X. There we go. We figured it out. It's direct X. I don't I remember what it's, it's called. definitely not that. But there, there's some there's some way of doing that. And I so I, I configured that. I never use it. Whatever. So I the first two years I had my NAS, I bought a certificate through Name Jeep that was like Ew. a legit certificate. The only certificate I've bought, I did it twice. You know, it was like eight dollars a year or something. So I did that and I'm like, okay, well, midway through the first year, I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, I did another year cause it was easy. Um, but, um, Synology added support to auto provision, uh, let's encrypt certs. So that's how I'm doing it now. Uh, there are a couple things you need to note for that. So when I first set up the NAS, I switched, let's see, I disabled HTTP access. It's only HTTPS. 
and I'm doing it on a custom port, and I only had that port open in my router. So only that one was seeing the internet. Now to use Let's Encrypt, it needs to be on HTTP and it needs to be internet facing. So port 80 is open on my NAS and my router pointing to it, but I think I have the web interface disabled still. Or maybe I have it on and I don't remember. I think I have something that locks it down a little bit that forces HTTPS somewhere in the settings. So that's how I've done it and that's how it auto provisions. So it just does it on its own. When I open up the Synology app on my phone every like 90 ish days, I have to say like, oh yeah, accept new certificate because it changed. Um, or, you know, the identity is a mismatch. Do you want to accept it? And I just blindly say yes. Like, like you do with all your certs. Yeah. Um, terms and conditions. So that's how I do it. And then when I'm on my local network, it's a different host name. So I just, you know, accept all the warnings and use it with a mismatch domain on HTTPS. So that's how I've done that. And then Got updating it. that domain there's some mode on Synology. I set this up a while ago, a couple of years ago. You can allow apps from untrusted sources or something, like third-party kind of things. Uh, I downloaded some like DDNS, Dynamic DNS, uh, Updater 2 or something. I had to install Perl, and then I installed that thing. Ooh, Perl. And there was some configuration that worked with Cloud, uh, Cloudflare. And so that's Cloudflare's hosting the... Or maybe it was Namecheap. Maybe Cloud, I forget which. One, it like it worked with the provider, and then I like granted API access, created a token for it, and then it does the auto DNS updating every fifteen minutes or something. Interesting. Now I also have another home server at home, and that has a different domain pointing at the same IP, and I have a different process running for updating that. If I was smart, I would just have one do it for both. But if I ever want to put nah, those nah. servers in different places, they'll just auto update themselves. So that's why I did it separately. So that's how I've set up mine. I can try to dig into it more and send you some deets if you're interested. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I think the thing that's going to be interesting to me too is like I have a I have a VPN um, that I use for a lot of my you know I have I have a couple of other like resources out there on the public internet that you know I I try not to have open ports here. So I, I was I was gonna see if I could maybe like site to site VPN the Synology into that and then somehow open the ports on my firewall there. I mean it's just one big brand in VPC. Exactly. Yeah. That's basically I'm trying to cobble together like a like a stupid VPC. Like the world's worst VPC. <laughs> so you know, any any hackers that are listening, I just told you my entire network topology. Thanks. I mean, they would have guessed. They would have guessed. I'm not that creative. Uh, speaking of not being creative, uh, time for me to talk about my Twitter followies and you to talk about yours and you to talk about yours. Uh, yeah, Twitter followies. Let's be clear. I'm the one who's not creative. The rest of you actually follow some cool people. Brandon, you're first on the list. You should go first. Oh no, terrifying. Uh so I followed uh the first account is an account called American Rails because they tweet about trains. And you know what trains are really cool. They tweeted about some French electrical locomotives that were tested out by Amtrak in the seventies, but unfortunately never saw the light of day. Uh but they look pretty darn cool. And you know what? I like train content on my Twitter feed. So that's why I followed that account. I also followed uh refollowed rather an account called the heavy table um which probably got caught in my unfollow web of you know whatever that was june july 2020 but you know in part because they were dormant uh they uh shut down uh i want to say last year at some point but they were a a really neat and and cool force for food writing local food writing in minneapolis and st paul uh, and in greater minnesota as well um and they have really kind of an interesting um and like really like craft focused take on the industry, which I think is really cool. And you all know that I like my food. So that's what that's all about. Uh, and then last but not least is turn underscore on underscore red, uh, which is a really, really awesome pin artist uh, or enamel pin uh, creator who makes these really cool dynamic um, like, uh, and when I say dynamic, you know, I guess it's kind of buzzwordy, but they're like, it's literally a, uh, an enamel pin that has like moving parts. Yeah. Um, so there's one that's like an emotion selector and there's a bunch of other ones where it's like, um, you know, there's one that, that I picked up that's called, that just says per my last email, um, which is, uh, uh as the kids say a vibe. 
and I really, really like this person's work. Uh, I just came across my feed, I want to say, a couple days ago. And I was like, oh, man. So I so I, I picked up like a whole bunch of pins from there because enamel pins turns out they're really cool. That is my Twitter followies. How about you, Brian? Nice. Oh, I always like some uh, enamel pins. I'm starting to put them on my backpack that I carry around the city. And when I'm like going to work, you know, from going to the lake or working at a coffee shop or something. No, non-pandemic times. Anyway, uh, I followed uh, not very many people since last time, since it's only been a month, but I did follow Maggie Appleton or Mappletons. She works at Egghead and does their art direction and um, kind of design and ske- sketching. Uh, she's worked with Dan Abramov on his um, Just JavaScript series, or I think they kind of worked on it together. So it's co-authorship there. She does a really good way of like visualizing and coming up with mental models for uh, programming paradigms. She's like really phenomenal stuff. Um, she had the first talk at React Rally on the anthropology of React. Great talk. Highly recommend checking it out once they post the videos. Definitely someone to keep an eye on. And she's been featured in a few podcasts like React Podcast and uh, I think Undefined maybe. Um, great episodes there. Uh, next up is Jem Young. Uh, same name and handle. Um, he does infrastructure at Netflix. Um, and panelists on Front End Happy Hour, a podcast I don't actually listen to. I probably should. Yeah, so he also gave a talk at React Rally, but just another um, another front end person in my feed that I like to keep keep that front end coming. So um, definitely recommend following him as well. And last but not least is uh, MDN WebDocs, which is the handle MosDevNet. So I followed this around when Mozilla announced all their layoffs. Um, I wanted to stay up to date with the MDN WebDocs news and things so because i am a very frequent attender of mdn do you know they have merch i need to buy something from there i did not know they had that i did not know Get that their mdn logo on a shirt or some something funny uh so yeah anyway yeah those those are the accounts i follow you know i don't normally find myself asking for a merch link but you're gonna have to send us one later i will put one in the show notes perfect um while you're doing that, let me tell you about my Twitter followees. For some reason, I followed people uh, recently, and most of these are like organic things. Um, usually, people retweeted something, and I thought, "Cool, I guess they must be worth following." I don't know anything about them. I don't think I've seen anybody that I'm going to talk about tweets. So maybe they'll tweet eventually. Uh, Mate Pap. <laughs> Uh, is so, the first first person? Yeah, go ahead. If I if I can pause you right there, sorry, I'll let you get back to it in just a sec. It's kind of funny because I'm like, oh, I recognize some of these people, so it's very possible that I retweeted some of them <laughs> into your feed. Yeah, you you, you remember, remember what uh, we talked about in our fringe episode earlier today? Why, yes, I do. Uh, well, see, the listeners don't, and so listeners, you should go and listen to our amazing fringe episode that we had earlier tonight. Basically, uh, Brandon is everyone's Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what we concluded. So yeah, mate, uh, I think he talks about JavaScript sometimes. Um, imagine that, right? Uh, let's see, who else do we have here? We have Brandon Dial, I think is what it says here. Um, accessibility engineer, or engineer on accessibility at Discord, which is pretty cool. Uh, but also, I believe he's doing some work with Rust, which I found to be interesting. I think the Rust org retweeted him. Uh, and then last I have here, uh, Ives Van something. He created uh, Code Sandbox, uh, which I use a lot for making little demos and examples of stuff. And so I thought it would be cool to follow him based on some retweet I saw somewhere. Uh, and then finally, uh, everybody likes a good delivery, even if you're not in the logistics business. Uh, and so uh, I followed USPS, because why would they even have a Twitter account? Well, they do. And not only do they have an account, but they have 416,000 followers. Look at that. So that number has grown significantly in the past few weeks. But also, when you read the the tweets here, it, there's a, you know, it, as the trend today in, in, in the time that we live in, it, there's a lot of memes. Got to get that engagement. Yeah, it's it's kind of fun. Well, uh, let's see what do we what do we got coming up next time in the next month here. September is going to be uh, fall with some more cooler temps. Um, maybe a frost. Hopefully not that. Um, yeah, I hope not so soon. But you know, I heard it's going to be fifty so or so for low. Uh, so that means the highs aren't going to stay warm for much longer anyway. So I don't know. You know, around this time of year, there would be a couple of Apple events. Um, 
I, you know, we we do talk about apple around sometimes here. Yeah, at, at the orchard. Yeah, at the orchard or or in the Cupertino, either one. It sounds like that that event's going to be in October, so maybe uh, maybe we'll get another episode in before that. We'll see. Update from September twelfth as I edit this because I'm super slow at editing. There's going to be an event on Tuesday, September fifteenth. So just a couple of days from now, rumored to be Apple Watch and iPad. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see. Um, you know, we we could be recording our next episode on on new Apple Silicon computers. How wild would that be? I'm not I'm not buying any new computers. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Brendan says. I say now, and then he buys it and then returns it like another podcaster that we know. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I I would love to do that. Um, yeah, no, that's pretty much my my time. I'm gonna be working. Um, we were talking in one of our Slack channels that we should all take time off. So if you're a listener, you should take some time off. I'm taking Monday off. It's Labor Day. I think that's default. I'm also on call. So how off is it really? Not that off. Yeah, you gotta. There's a tw- Twitter thread I should try to find about how companies treat time off and also on call. And I I agree with that thread, so I should find it. But you know, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah. So I'm not even anyway, going to say it. I yeah, I'm on call for Labor Day and for Thanksgiving. So oh wow, all that holiday. But the nice thing is that usually means there's a lot lower volume. Though you know, Black Friday, we'll see what happens there. But I was going to take that Friday off. I don't think I will anymore. No, everyone else will take the day off, which means it'll be a great day to work because it'll just be me and I'll get a lot done. It's funny how that's true, right? Working holidays is actually kind of nice. Oh, it's wonderful. I've done it. I've never taken the Friday after Thanksgiving off and I was going to this year and now I'm not going to. So anyway, yeah, not, not too much in September. Other than just seasons are changing, getting cooler. I am not going to the state fair because there's really isn't a state fair. Though I see, I saw some photos of people driving through it, there is buying no lots state of food, fair. but sitting in their car. That's not for me. That's weird. <laughs> if, if I wanted a traffic jam, I would just drive on 94 yep. any time of day. Yeah. So true. 94, the worst highway. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I've heard, I have, I have no, no personal experience, but you can get a, I think 50 chicken nuggets from Wendy's for twelve ninety nine. dollars Uh, so just, just get, get your nuggets and then go sit on 94 and it's like, you're, you're at the food parade. Wow. Yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty much. That sounds about right. Goodness gracious. Well, for my part, um, I'm going to be launching some stuff this month, which is cool. So, you know, I'll be, you can find me on the internet and I'll be talking about it very, very, very likely. Some, some of it might be stuff that you two have already seen, but it'll be kind of fun as stuff gets wrapped up and launched to the world and then just kind of trying to figure out what the heck is next. So, you know, just closing out the year for me. Starts now. Closing out the year starts now because we are, get this, in quarter four, wow. the fourth quarter, the last quarter. And, uh, you know, given the opportunity, I like to take fourth quarter a little bit slow if I possibly can. I think that's a good choice. Yep. Working up to eventually taking the full fourth quarter off, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> which is a thing you can only do if you're a one person shop, because if you if anybody else, um, if you need to pay anybody else whatsoever, they can't and nobody should tolerate not getting paid for the fourth quarter of the year. But if you can figure out how to do it as an individual, it can be pretty sweet. I'm told. I've never done it, but I'm told. <laughs> One day. Well, uh, uh, where, can, where can we find you all if people want to get in touch or see what you're up to? You can find me just about anywhere, but particularly on Instagram where I'm Brandon underscore I'm in. And I actually coincidentally use that same thing on Twitter. Switch out the underscore with a dot and you got Brandon dot MN, which is my website. Uh, which currently has not a lot on it, but might be as I launch stuff. Hey, hey, do you, do you think your website's intentionally left blank by any chance? No, that's the other one. That's the <laughs> other one that's intentionally left blank. It's not only left blank, it's also left unstyled, and that was totally intentional too. There's, there's, there's another site that you've been promoting a lot, is which is kind of terrifying. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Ter- yeah. Terrifying.us or us. Yeah, terrifying.us. That's a that's a fun that's a fun one. Uh some folks on the internet have made fun of me uh from time to time for my repeated phrases. Uh but any which way. Uh I think <laughs> the uh classic you know, one of the other common ones I use is terrifying and so um, as part of a uh, domain buying frenzy that occurred over the past month, one of the domains I picked up is terrifying.us. And uh, you've been slowly updating it from time to time with uh, some kind of funny artifacts of things that are terrifying. And, and none of none of the jokes, okay, well, some of the jokes only don't work in Chrome. So get, a, get an iPhone, I guess. 
yeah, if you're not using Safari, what are you doing? <laughs> Jeez. Which is, it's, it's funny because other people are like, oh, you know, like Safari, it's like the IE of the web, uh, of the modern web. And I'm like, you know what? Every time I work on an app, just despite those people, I'm going to work very hard to make sure everything I do works well in Safari. That, that's me all the time. <laughs> Have you, like, the people who say that haven't worked to support IE. Like, Safari is nothing compared to IE. Oh, they have. Right, truly. Yeah. Especially in performance. Like, I was working in IE um, earlier this week to the point where if I had dev tools open and I would make an update and I, it, like, reloading the page immediately crashes dev tools, like, every single time. <laughs> like, the memory usage is so high that it just, I can't recover. I had, I was, I couldn't depend on console logs as it was bootstrapping. So I was just, I was literally logging things to the window object. Like I'm just, instead of logging, I just do window dot whatever equals whatever. Terrible ways of debugging. Terrifying even dot us. Anyway, so Ryan, when is the uh, amazing dot us website coming? Cause that's another, that's a phrase you say a lot. Uh, <laughs> I never thought of that. Um, probably not anytime soon. <laughs> uh, I, I have um, other domains that I will talk to you later about uh, that I need to purchase. Uh, there, there are whole brands to begin and whole brands to end. Wonderful. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, heygetbacktu.work, which I've had for way too long now, uh, I will let the domain expire. So uh, get to it now before you before you can't <laughs> bask in the wonderful jQuery that it is. Anyway, Ryan, where can we find you? Oh, well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMR. And of course, on my website, RyanRampersad.com. If you go down to the history section and you look at what I did in, I believe, August, it's hard to know if that's another way to say March or not, uh, you'll find that it has a lot of stuff in it. We were super busy, and it is documented there. Nice. Very nice. And you can find me on the internet uh, on Twitter at Brian Mitch L, or on Instagram at Brian Mitch L, or on my website, brianm.me. You know, I should probably buy brianmitchell.com or something and just redirect it. That seems like a smart move. <laughs> Just for consistency, I can just say the one thing. Well, so what you should do is you should do what I did, which is buy RyanMR.com or, you know, your Twitter handle and then have it redirect to some random internal Google server. And it just shows you the 404 robot. And that's it. Like, that's what it does. Why? <laughs> I Oh, it's even better now. It changed. Yep. There you go. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't know why. Error colon server error amazing yep it's been like this for years wow oh it's a 502 what does that one mean again i don't know proxy failed here that's a bad gateway <laughs> interesting anyway well uh that's our pod kit for the day if you want to find the show notes you can go to the nexus.tv slash pk60 or uh, swipe over to that tab in your in your podcast player that definitely supports show notes in its full entirety you can also talk about the episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, or our Twitter, which is twitter.com slash the Nexus TV. But if you're there, you should probably just tag us directly, which we have just covered. And then if you like what we're doing over here at the Nexus in the entirety, uh, head on over to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV, and uh, give us some tips, I guess. Even if you don't like it in its entirety, even if you just like a little piece, you should still do it. Like, j just pod kit. Uh, that way, we can make Ian just send people stickers, and that will be, um, you'll, you'll be able to support the post office that way. Yeah, you get stickers. There we go. Or if, if you really want stickers, too, you can find us in, in real life, which is hard to do these days. Yeah, it's gotten consider considerably harder in the past, like, eight months. I wonder what that's about. Yeah, I don't know why. I definitely have walked around Uptown and seen people I recognize and, like, waved hello. That's kind of jarring. You just don't expect to ever see people you know at all these days. In real life? Yeah. Anyway, well, that's our show. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.